Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin. Ve salatu ve selam. Ala Seyyidil Mursalin, Seyyidina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve sellem. Esselamu Aleyküm ve Rahmetullahi ve Berkatuhu. Before starting, uh, when Nelson Mandela passed, there was great controversy. Even some Muslims saying, oh, you, sh you shouldn't even talk about Mandela. He's going to hell. And, uh, and some of you are familiar, most of you are familiar with those kind of discussions that possibly even transpired in your local community centers and masjids. <clears throat> so I want to take a moment uh, to point out that the idea of uh, taking lessons from significant events and personalities, this is something that lies at the heart of Islam. Allah Ta'ala mentions in the Quran by <clears throat> way of example, Alif Lam Mim Gulibatil Rum fi Adnil Ardwahum and Badi Ghalibim Sayyadlibun fi Bidri Sinin Wulillah al Amrum and Kablu and Bad Wyomini Yafrahul Mukminun Binasrullah so the Romans have been defeated in a nearby land and after this victory of theirs they will soon be after this defeat of theirs they will soon be victorious in a few years and, and with Allah's the command uh, previously and afterwards and on that day the believers will rejoice in the victory of Allah and Allah gives victory to whomever so so ever he pleases and Allah is mighty and merciful. So the Romans were not Muslims. They weren't Muslims, but Allah Ta'ala calls our attention to this event in the Quran because it's a momentous event. It's an event that has tremendous import for all of the peoples in the region. And so the Muslims were concerned about the outcome and even it's related that Abu Bakr went when this was revealed, he made a wager with the, uh, the Quraysh that <clears throat> the, the Romans would be victorious. And it didn't happen right away and they started to uh, ridicule him and then the victory came as Allah Ta'ala prophesied. So the, the point though is the Romans and Persians, these weren't Muslims, but Allah calls our attention to them because they were in the region and their affair was an affair that affected the life of people in the region. Similarly, uh, personalities, Allah Ta'ala says uh, concerning Dhul Qarnayn, We yasalunak an Dhul Qarnayn, kus atdu alaykum minhu dhikra. So Allah Ta'ala says, they ask you concerning Dhul Qarnayn. So, uh, say to them, I will relate to you something of his story. So Vulkarnain, most uh, opinions say it was Alexander the Great. There's difference of opinion, but no one says he was a prophet. Imam uh, Jalalain mentions, Ismuhu kana Iskandar, wa lam yakun nabiyan. His name was Iskandar, Alexander the Great, and he wasn't a prophet. But Allah relates his story, something of his story in the Quran to present lessons for us, to provide a context for presenting lessons. So as we look at the, the life and times of Nelson Mandela, there are lessons that we can take and that we should take. And there's another point to be made here, and that is as Muslims, we have to have a rich, deep, nuanced understanding of history. Because as they say, those who don't know history are destined to repeat its mistakes. The mistakes that people made, if we don't know about them, if we don't know what facilitated the success of people, then we're destined to repeat the mistakes and we're destined to let the factors that led to success pass us by. And this isn't the kind of ummah that we are, we're people of, of reflection, we're people of contemplation. We should, we, we should be familiar with the biographies and stories of great personalities like Nelson Mandela, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and others. We should, be, uh, we should read the literature of peoples. We should read the, the great literature that conveys uh, uh, insight into the depths of the struggles of people. We should be familiar with people's struggle. No Muslim should come to this land and be oblivious 
to these lands and be oblivious to the history of these lands, to the struggles, the struggle of the native people, or as you say here, the First Nation people. Those are the people who preceded us here. Those are the people whose lands we're occupying. Those are, you talk about occupied territory, all of North America's occupied territory. We should know that. We should know the, who are the Iroquois, who are the Navajo, who are the Hopi, who are the Nez Perce, who are the Arapaho, the Sioux, the Comanches, the Apache. Who are these people? Who are their great figures and personalities? Who was Chief Joseph? Who was, who was Geronimo? Who was uh, Cochise? Who are, who are these people? Who was the guy that led Lewis and Clark across this country? And why was, why, was, why was she able to lead them? Because none of the tribes, none of the tribes would, would transgress against someone who had taken the protection of a woman. This, and this is, a, this is an Islamic practice. On the day of uh, Fatih Mecca, the, the, the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she gave her personal oath of protection. There were some of the uh, Quraysh that actually fight. Two individuals, Umhani, her name was Umhani. Umhani gave her personal aman to two people that fought on that day and no one touched them, no one touched them. And the Prophet Sallallahu he said, the one who Umhani has given an oath of protection to, all of the Muslims respect. Dhimmatul Muslimina Wahida. The protective oath of a Muslim is one. It extends to the entire Ummah. So this, but the native people, they had that principle. And so Lewis and Clark were able to go across all of these tribal lands. And everyone they met, when they saw that they were being escorted by a woman, they let, they let them pass. And they were able to go from the East Coast to the West Coast. So we should know the history of the people. We should know their literature. We should know their struggles. We should know the struggles of, 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 of the African-American people. We should know the struggle of the Irish people. We should know the struggle of Afro-Canadians. We should know the history of the Underground Railroad. How did you get uh, African populations in, in, in Canada? We should know that history because it's our history if indeed we are now the sons and daughters of this land. And I don't say now for me, my people were here. <laughs> some came as slaves, some were here uh, welcoming Lewis and Clark. Nelson, so Nelson Mandela wasn't a Muslim, but he was a great historical figure. And we can take lessons from his life. One lesson we can take, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he elevates people. So no one in, in Nelson Mandela, the village he grew up in, Kunu, he was born in a nearby village, but most of his childhood, and he says in his uh, biog autobiography, long, the long walk to freedom, that most of his formative years and his best memories are in Kunu, and that's where he's buried. But this skinny kid running around those dusty uh, pathways, no, they didn't have paved streets. If someone said one day he would be honored by kings and presidents, no one would have believed him. They say, no, Nelson, you, you, you lost your mind. You, you've, you've, were they burning grass and you imbibed some of it? They, no one would believe it, but Allah elevates whomsoever he pleases. We mentioned yesterday uh, in, in the uh, talk last night, you elevate whomsoever you please and you debase whomsoever you please. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he desires to elevate some uh, skinny kid in a village in South Africa to be honored by kings and presidents, 
to reconcile between a struggling people. There's only one thing, kun fayakun. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to elevate any one of you out in this audience, he can do it. It's not something one should long for, but it's not something you should want run away from. Be where Allah places you, but you should always be prepared for greatness. Some people are afraid of greatness. Don't be afraid of greatness because through your greatness, Allah Ta'ala might choose to do great things, to use you as a means to do great things, to use you as a means to save lives, to use you as a means to help to, to, to cleanse this planet. As you saw last night of the, the death and the disease that's being rained down on it. So don't run away from it. Prepare yourself for it, but don't run to it. But if Allah Ta'ala brings it to you, that's a sign you have tawfiq and it's humility. And one of the things that cultivated humility in the prophets, our Prophet وسلم, instructed us, and we see this in many, the lives of many people. No one humbles themselves for the sake of Allah except that Allah elevates them. So humble yourself and Allah might choose to elevate you and use you to do great things. But one of the things, Mandela had humility and he was stubborn for justice. But he was very humble. And one of the things that uh, inculcated humu humility in the prophets, including our prophet Muhammad وسلم, was that they were shepherds. And they learned to be compassionate and to care for animals. It takes a humble spirit. Uh, arrogant people, they're the people that kick cats. And they throw rocks at dogs. And they, they torture frogs. This is arrogance. It's a humble spirit who has the power they're larger than many of the animals. They have weapons, they have bows and arrows, they have firearms. It's a humble spirit that deals compassionately with animals. And Mandela was a shepherd. A lot of people don't know that. Nelson Mandela started his life at about five years old. He tended sheep and he, had, he, had, he tended uh, to cattle. And, and one of the things he says in his autobiography, we just quote briefly, he says that, and this is a quote, he says, I discovered the almost mystical attachment that the Hosa people have, with, have for cattle, not only as a source of food and wealth, but as a blessing of God and a source of happiness. As a blessing of God and a source of happiness. So we should encourage our, our children to visit farms, Get animals. You can have most places animals in your backyard. You can buy a sheep. He might only last until eight. <laughs> but until, until he does, to be treat him gently. And then he'll love you. He'll love to be your zabiha. He'll love to know that he's going to give you energy to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's what he was created for. And he loves to be in the care of a compassionate person. You should give him a name. Give the sheep a name. The Prophet Sallallahu he gave names to all of his animals. And that was part of his compassion to them. They weren't just things. This is what the, the commodification of everything, it makes everything a thing. It even makes people a thing. You know, people have, like they have a, a starter how, house, so I get this little cottage, this little bungalow. That's my starter house. And they have their starter cars. Now people have starter wives. You know, you've heard the expression, right? Oh, this is my starter wife. When I get established and I get my practice off the ground, then I'll get my trophy wife. Am I making these terms up? Then the commodification, a trophy. A starter. No, we're human beings. And compassionate treatment of animals helps to bring out the compassion in us. This is a lesson we can learn from, definitely, certainly from our prophets, alayhi salam, 
but from people like Mandela. The Prophet mentioned, what did he say concerning all the Kulukum Ra'in? Wa Kulukum Mas'ulun An Ra'iyati. All of you are shepherds, and each of you will be asked concerning how they treated their flock, to translate it along those lines. All of us are shepherds. How do we learn to be a good shepherd? Start in the youth with the children and animals and compassionate treatment of animals. Mandela's struggle was for the dignity of all people. And that's why all people love Mandela. He struggled for the dignity of all people, not just the dignity of the African tribes, the Hosa and the Zulu and others, for the dignity of all people. And the Muslims support it, a lot of Muslims, not universally, in South Africa. And some are in this audience. I've talked to some today. And they told me their stories uh, concerning Nelson Mandela. And when, as they were speaking, they had genuine love in their hearts. Genuine love in their hearts. A, a lesson from that we can learn. One uh, sister from South Africa told me this about two hours ago. Or, or her husband. She told me another story. That one of the political cartoonists, he was lambasting Mandela in the Cape Town newspaper, printing derogatory cartoons, ridiculing his political positions, giving him a really hard time. His name was Shapiro. Giving him a really hard time. And the newspaper, they stopped his cartoon. Nelson Mandela called this person. He couldn't believe it. They said, the president's on the line. He wants to talk to you. He said, you know, what happened to your cartoons? He said, well, how come they're not being printed? And he said, I thought you should be happy. I was giving you such a hard time. He said, that's your right. This is a free country. We can't be a democracy if we don't respect people's right to freely express themselves. And Mandela won this man's heart over. He would come to praise Mandela and to appreciate his openness and his honesty and his humility. It's a humble spirit who, who can humble himself and say to someone, how come you're not insulting me anymore? That's the humble. And so our Prophet ﷺ, when the person would put garbage and debris in his doorway and he came out and it wasn't there, he went to check up on him. You know, what's going on? I didn't see the garbage and thorns in my pathway. You okay? And the man became Muslim. Because he knew what? He knew this heart is not the average heart. This heart is not the average heart. We have to have hearts like that, brothers and sisters. And people like Mandela, he's not a Muslim, but they remind us of this. They remind us of this. The, the uh, Ibn Mas'ud, Jubilati al ala hubbi man ahsana ilaha. Ilayha. Human hearts have been naturally predisposed to love those who do them good, who treat them well. This is a natural predisposition in the human being. So you want people to, to love you? Treat them well, and they'll love you. So, but Mandela worked for all people. And many Muslims stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Nelson Mandela. So, for example, the Muslim Judicial Council the Cape Town Muslim Youth Association, the Young Men's Muslim Association, the Muslims' version of the YMCA, they had the YMMA. So you had the Young Men's Christian Association, the Muslims had the Young Men's Muslims Association, the Cape Vigilance Association. They all joined together in 1961. When the struggle was really heating, heating up, they issued a proclamation called the Call to Islam. And they said, I quote again, they said that we stand with our brothers, referring to their African brothers, and fighting the evil monster that is about, is about to devour us. So they understood apartheid wasn't just destroying the lives of African people. It was destroying everyone's lives, if you want part of the, this very small white minority. It was an equal opportunity destroyer, and it called for a, a, a joint movement, a collaborative movement, a cooperative movement to fight against it. And that movement produced many Muslim martyrs. 
Many Muslims were martyred in the anti-apartheid struggle. There, there was a sister, she might still be here. I met her yesterday. She was uh, incarcerated. Uh, one of my very dear family friends, their mother was incarcerated in the struggle, standing in their Muslim family, standing with, with Nelson Mandela. So there were many Muslims, and they're probably the most famous martyr of the movement was Imam Abdullah Harun. Abdullah Harun was taken into custody, tortured for several months, and then died under police torture in police custody, September 27, 1969. A martyr, and this Muslim martyr, an imam in the community, an editor of one of the major Muslim newspapers, a martyr in the struggle to end the racist system, the satanic, demonic system that our, our brother was talking about previously. It, all of us have a responsibility. Mandela was part of the third world movement, a movement of all peoples who are being systematically denied their rights, their property, their resources usurped by the imperialist powers of the world. So as nations decolonized, uh, primarily in the aftermath of the Second World War, their struggle was a global struggle. It was a struggle of Muslims. It was a struggle of, of other people in the, so the formerly known as the Third World, the Third World Revolution. So Mandela was part of that Third World Revolution. And many Muslims were part of that Third World Revolution. They stood toe to toe because they realized that the Muslims alone are not their power resources are not sufficient alone to escape the, the oppression, to escape the clutches of imperialism, that they have to stand toe to toe with their African and Asian and Latin American brothers and sisters who aren't Muslims. This is what the kind of struggle that Nelson Mandela uh, urged. In 1955, for example, Man Mandela joined with Asians, with people of mixed race background, coloreds as they were called at that time in South Africa, to start what he called the, the what they called the Freedom Charter. So it was the Muslims, the Hindus, and others. It was the coloreds, the Africans, all coming together to demand a freedom, a free society. And the Freedom Charter called for a democratic, non-racial state that strove for economic justice for all of its members. This is the kind of movement that Mandela was involved with and is one of the great tragedies of our age, is that when Muslims, when we uh, experience something, it's like no one else has experienced it. When Muslims in the United States are confronted with the racism and bigotry that the people who preceded us have encountered for over two or three uh, centuries in some instances. It becomes our unique struggle. So we give it a unique name. We call it Islamophobia. We don't call it racism. We don't call it bigotry. We don't call it by a name that will instantly unite us with the struggle of the Native American people who preceded us, with the struggle of the African slaves and then the African American people who preceded Muslims, with the struggle of the Chinese and Japanese American people, the Chinese Americans who, who faced the, the, the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1888, and the Japanese Americans who were interned in concentration camps during the Second World War and the struggle of the Latinos, of Cesar Chavez and the farm workers. It's not oppression, it's not racism, it's not bigotry, it's Islamophobia, as if Muslims were the first people to encounter brutality, oppression, prejudice, and racism in America. That's wrong, brothers and sisters. And the Arab Spring was not the first uprising against authoritarian regimes. We had the European Spring. 
where all of those former Eastern European nations of the, so of the former Soviet bloc cast off the yoke of totalitarianism. We had the African Spring, when the nations, many of the nations in Africa stood up and challenged the dictatorship and the authoritarian rule that they were subjective to. And then we had what we call the Arab Spring. And I will argue that one of the reasons the Arab Spring has encountered so much difficulty is the failure from the outset to build bridges of solidarity with the Africans and others who preceded the Arabs in the struggle against authoritarian dictatorships. We have to have solidarity, brothers and sisters. And this is something Nelson Mandela taught us. If it were left to the people in South Africa, we might still have apartheid. But you have solidarity with people all over the world. You have solidarity with African Americans. There's people like Maxine Waters and people like Randall Robinson, Trans Africa, and people like Jesse Jackson. And people were struggling on these campuses to, 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 to create a, a powerful divestment movement. I was personally honored to be one of the leaders of that movement in the New York, New Jersey area at Rutgers University. And then our movement, we, we were able to build solidarity with students at Princeton and then with Columbia University. And then all through three universities joined hundreds of others, if not thousands, in divesting from companies that do business in South Africa. That was international solidarity. Brothers and sisters, we need international solidarity. And believe me, when people know about the brutalities that are being inflicted on the people of Syria, when people know about the massacres that have transpired in places like Egypt or in Yemen or Bahrain, when they know they will stand with you, they will stand with us, they will stand toe to toe with Muslims because they understand from their struggles the odds that we face in these various countries and the odds are daunting. So brothers and sisters, take a lesson from Nelson Mandela. Look beyond the confines of these borders that are artificial entities in any case. Look beyond those borders and look to your brothers and sisters in Africa. Look to your brothers and sisters in Latin America. Look to your brothers and sisters elsewhere because they will stand with you. And one of the first people to stand with you would be the people of South Africa. Nelson Mandela was ridiculed. Now he's a hero. In his life, there were people who distanced themselves from Mandela for one reason, because Mandela would not distance himself from the Palestinians. He said, the Palestinians stood with us when no one would stand with us, and I'm not going to, now that, I, that our people are free, we will continue to work for the freedom of the people of Palestine. That was a stance Mandela took. So brothers and sisters, stand with others, they will stand with you. And if we stand alone, we'll find ourselves facing all of these authoritarian oppressive powers alone. And either we, as they say, either we hang in there together or we simply hang separately. May Allah give us strength. In conclusion, we just want to say that we mentioned humility, the ability to pardon. Mandela was tortured. And you can read about the torture if you choose, not the, hey, read about the torture. It's like, read about the good ship lollipop. But you should read the life and the struggle. You can, and, and in that context, you will read of the torture. You will read of the hardship. You will read of the difficulties. You will read of the people that were assassinated, the assassinations. Despite all of that, Mandela found within himself, within himself, the wisdom and the power to forgive and to pardon when he was free. Realizing to do otherwise not only would be a, a, a lesser moral course, it would lead to a bloodbath. 
because as we mentioned at the retreat, we are manipulated by powers that are working for our destruction. And one of the things that we have to be wary, they create what are called in political terms a balance of terror. They'll take a small minority and they'll provide them a disproportionate amount of weaponry. And then the majority will be relatively unarmed or lightly armed. So the majority has the number, the minority has the weapons. In South Africa, the white majority had the weapons. The African peoples and others had the numbers. And so when they come in the conflict, it's a balance of terror. The, the ones with the weapons don't have the numbers to overwhelm the ones with the numbers. The ones with the numbers don't have the weapons to overwhelm the one with the weapons. And so there's a balance and it keeps going on and on and on until they either destroy each other or they decide that they're being played like the proverbial fiddle and they back down and say, you know, what we're, what we're after isn't worth destroying everything and everybody for. And Mandela realized that this balance of terror was being set up in South Africa. And he said, I'm not going to have a part of it. And he forgave. And one of the reasons he was elevated, we mentioned, the same hadith, the sentence before that, no one finds within themselves the, the power to pardon except that Allah exalts them. So brothers and sisters, don't look at a calculation based on just material means, material resources, Factor Allah Ta'ala and the power of Allah into the calculation. Factor Allah into the calculation. And then you will see amazing things happen. In conclusion, brothers and sisters, there are difficult and challenging days. We meet them with our dignity. We meet them with a smile. That's the way of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But our smile doesn't lessen the daunting nature of the challenges before us. And those challenges are going to have to take, uh, or overcoming them will take serious individuals. Individuals who, if necessary, are willing to go to jail. Individuals who, if necessary, are willing to put their life on the line so that others may live. And this was something Nelson Mandela was willing to do. He was willing to go to prison and he was willing to die so that his people could live. If you kill me, if you incarcerate me, and this allows my people to live, then I'm the first one to, to say, put me in jail, take my life. Ibn Taymiyyah said something once. He said, he was asked to describe the believer, al-mu'min. He said, qatluhu nafyuhu riyada. That if you put him in prison, it's an opportunity for intense worship. If you exile him for the land, it's an opportunity to travel and see the world. If you kill him, it's martyrdom, and he has the fast lane, express lane to paradise. And, and in the next life, he'll have good, which is Jannah, he'll have Ziyada, which is the Ru'ya, the beatific vision. So there's nothing better than that in existence. So brothers and sisters, don't hesitate to take a dangerous position. Don't hesitate if it means that someone can be freer, if it means that the earth can be cleaner, if it means that our future generations will have an opportunity to live a dignified life with an environment that can sustain them. If opposing the forces that are undermining that means that we go to jail, it means that we lose our life, 
Ahlan wa sahlan. And this is what Nelson Mandela said on the eve of his incarceration for 27 years, almost 28 years, when he was sentenced. He said a famous quote, many of you are familiar with it. During my lifetime, I have dedicated myself to this struggle of the African people. I have fought against white domination and I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve, but if needs be, it is an ideal I am prepared to die, for which I am prepared to die. So that was Nelson Mandela. And may he be an inspiration for us. May he be an example for us. And may history continue to remember him in a good way. We will be tested. It's inevitable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, Alif Lam Mim, do people think, do you think you'll be left alone? Do, he, do people think they'll be left alone merely saying we believe and not be tested? We tested those who preceded them in order that Allah will show which of them are truthful and which of them are liars. May Allah Ta'ala bless us to be amongst the truthful. May Allah bless all of you. May this conference be a source of inspiration, motivation, but also guidance. And in the fi uh, final session, uh, all of us have things to share in terms of practical steps you can take to take that inspiration and that motivation and translate it into positive action. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.